Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Amory kindly said, my name is Simon Kane. I'll try and cut straight to the chase because I want to get as much crammed in as I can. These are the organisations I work for. Uh, you will soon realise I'm the non-academic in the room. I'm from a purely commercial background. But, but just by chance, I ended up working for, I think, 50 different universities. And I also work for lots of funders. So I do all their presentation skills work. And some of them let me sit in on panel interviews, which is a real insight. And I think I've worked with 300 people one-to-one, -one, helping them prepare pitches. And more and more, that's what I do. Uh, lots for the NIHR. And all my slides today, kind of, 98%, are all they're going to be is examples of what some of your colleagues have done to be successful at a pitch. If you're not looking forward to pitching, most people don't. Uh, but you have to get good at it. You know, there's so much work putting your application together, getting through the first round, getting to the final pitch. You don't want to blow it at the final whistle. So you've probably heard, uh, it's really old school, there are three Ps of pitching. It is old school, but it's what you need to do in every pitch. And you probably know already, these are the three key things we're going to focus on. Um, by the way, I will get a set of handouts to you. I can't give you the slides, because people have said I can show them, but not give them out. But everything you need to know will be in a set of notes. So it's entirely up to you if you want to, to write anything down. Project, what precisely you're trying to do. Person, why you're the right person to do it. Place, why you're in the right place to make it successful. Uh, one little proviso before we start, I always have a little war. I think I've had a war with all 300 people that I've worked with. And it's all summed up by this little acronym, Moscow. So whenever you meet someone and they've done this almighty application form, and you say, look, you've only got five minutes to do this. And they say, well, I must include this. Absolutely, I must. And then to be honest, I really should say this. Oh, and I could say this about my methodology. But I'll tell you what, we'll have a deal. I won't say that bit. The reality is you can't cut the content there. You've got to cut it right up there. Do you know, a pitch is really difficult. You've done this really incredibly in-depth application. Only the key points can get into the pitch. So you will see some of these pitches. I think they're ever so simple. But most people on the panel won't have read your application. Quite a lot of them won't even looked at it. It'll be the first time they know anything about it. So you just have to hold their attention for five to 10 minutes, get them to understand it, and allow them to ask sensible questions. So without further ado, can we start with project? It is the most important part of your pitch. It's the bit you need to start with, I think. And the three key things that I work on, really, it's just like clockwork, like routine, is give me the background. What's going wrong? What do we not know? Why is it important? What precisely is your research aim? So what is this proposal going to achieve? And then how are you going to achieve it in terms of methods, project plan, dissemination, PPI? And what I'm going to do is break that down into five specific questions. So if you've never done a pitch before, it wouldn't be a bad start just to follow these five simple steps. But what I would say to you is pretty much 70% of your pitch needs to focus on project, I think, roughly. And these are just the things that I always work on. In terms of context, it's two questions. So what is the problem being addressed and why is it important? Really simple. You can dispense with all niceties, just jump straight into what is the problem, what's the scale of it, what are the implications, why is it essential that it's funded? Then we need to look at what precisely is your research question. And then finally, the nitty gritty, really, you know, how are you going to do it? What are we going to get as a funder in terms of output? You know, what do we get at the end? How will you disseminate this? How are you going to use PPI? What kind of impact is this going to have? So if it's all right with you, and you can actually chip in as we go along a little bit, can I just simply show you some examples initially of how people have done this bit? And then I'll show you an example of a fully worked one right through to there, if that's OK. Uh, before that, I thought I'd show you this is even professors can get stuff wrong. I know that sounds really cheeky. This is a professor from King's in London. Uh, she asked me to help her with a pitch. She's a real high flyer. She's like very clever, very funny. She said to me, I've got five minutes, two slides, but I'll show them. I'll do it all on one slide. So no moving around, you know, no nonsense. But to me, it's like dreary. It is to a panel. It's just dreary. They're sat in a room hearing seven applications in a row. It's just dull, especially if you show stuff like that. So we changed it. And what we're going to do is show you the first two sections. So she simply said, prostate cancer is a killer. It's the commonest cancer in the UK, and we know that one in eight men will be affected by it. If you're black, that one becomes a three. So for genetic reasons, three in eight black, uh, black men will get prostate cancer. We know that, like you all know, obviously, the earlier you diagnose it, the easier it is to treat, and vice versa. But we also know there's a link between poverty and diagnosis. 
That's why we picked the poorest borough in London, which is Newham. It's in one of the top 10 socially deprived regions of, of England. And we set up a clinic. And the reason you're seeing a simple picture of a London bus is we had a very small marketing budget and we spent the whole lot putting it towards adverts for every bus that went down Barking Road, which is in the London borough of Newham. And it advertised a clinic called Worried About Your Waterworks. It was open two evenings a week and it was tremendously successful at driving men in to get tested, diagnosed, treated. Not just from Newham, but the whole bottom quartile of the UK. The reason I'm here today is I want you to roll one of these out in every London borough. There are 31 London boroughs, we've got one in Newham, we want 30 more. And the way I'm going to do that today is to tell you the results we got in this trial, what we'll get if we go London-wide, and what are the cost implications of that. And the reason I'm here today, she said, I'm Professor Jill Mabin, I used to be a surgeon at the Royal London Whitechapel, I now lead research at King's in this area, I got the funding for this trial, I was based out there for six months duration, so it's a pleasure to be here today to tell you about it, I hope it's something you'll seriously think about funding. Now, I think it's got to be like that. You don't need to say things like, good afternoon, everyone, and um, you know, thanks very much for letting me come along and pitch today. And uh, you think, well, that's 30 seconds gone. So in a pitch, dispense with niceties. Use every single second you've got. I'm going to jump straight to it. This one was only two slides, two professors, both from the Institute of Psychiatry. Great. Vi I'm going to try and show you visuals that I like. You know, we, we don't want bullet bullet-pointed slides, ideally we want quick, simple, effective stuff. So we're going to kind of go left, right, left, right. One in four young people will experience anxiety every year. It's a really serious problem. Some people are seriously affected by it. Uh, it affects their education, their family, their future life. The gold standard treatment is cognitive behavioural therapy, which is about reprocessing thoughts, feelings and behaviour. It's expensive, it takes 12 weeks, it's one to one, you're very unlikely to get it. On top of that, we know 50% of people will never respond to CBT. We think for genetic reasons. That's why this research proposal is to create an app called Flare. We believe that will determine which candidates have even a remote chance of being successful with this and which ones won't. You have to, I'm giving you a really amateurish explanation of these things. These are clever people doing these things. So if, if you think, oh, that sounds a bit crass, don't worry about it. Uh, all of these are successful. This one last year, November, a midwife. Uh, no title, straight into the, the background. One in three women have experienced trauma, some kind of physical or sexual abuse in childhood or adulthood. It can have severe long-term consequences for mental health, for substance abuse, domestic violence. It can create stigma, which stops women taking up support. And for a lot of health professionals, they feel untrained and unable to deal with this. That's why I want to run a project called Empathy. It's about empowering pregnant women affected by trauma history, which is 250,000 pregnant women every year. With a simple goal is can we work out how can maternity services empower pregnant women who have experienced trauma to seek support? I'm doing loads because I just want you to see lots of examples, but they've got to be simple, short, metrics, implications. Um, you might recognize this if you ever see The Lancet. This was in The Lancet two years ago. It's a 16th century painting by the uh, painter Gelando. It's the first depiction of a woman with breast cancer, demonstrating it's been with us for hundreds, probably thousands of years. It's still with us today. It affects 55,000 new cases every year, 11,500 deaths. We know we can treat it, but we know it recurs frequently. Because it re recurs frequently, Women have to take medication for up to possibly five years, but we know between 50 and 75% of women don't complete that treatment. If they did, we'd save between 1,500 and 2,000 lives. The reason I'm here today is to come up with a program, both digital and human support, that will help women to complete their medication and reduce the number of overall deaths. Is that all right so far? All I've done for you so far is the first half. It needs to be quick, instant, it needs to be understandable, it needs to show the need, the implications. Really, really easy. And what I want to do now is just to complete the, uh, complete the whole sheet and I'll, I'll show you maybe some ideas on how do you do this bit. The audience need to know, the panel need to know immediately why is this important, why are you doing it, who is it going to affect, what precisely are you going to do. Oops, wrong one. Okay, uh, another psychiatrist for you. Uh, I thought this was one of the best pitches I've ever seen, the way she delivered it. Uh, straight to the point again. This is November last year, and she started with, I can hear her words in my ear now, the government have issued a call to action. 
they want evidence-based tools to address obesity. Why? Because it's a public health emergency. One in four of us is obese. The NHS spends seven and a half billion pounds on it every year, and it is becoming a crisis. For people with severe mental illness, it's much, much worse. Okay, so they're affected two to three times higher, and their life expectancy is reduced by 15 to 20 years. Partly lifestyle factors, partly processed food, but also, as some of you will know, the impact of antipsychotic drugs on appetite. We know that weight loss programs work. We have evidence for that. But she said, as 10 years as a psychiatrist, I've never managed to get one of my patients onto one of these programs. They're also expensive, they're time consuming, impossible to get onto. We know, though, that digital programs do work. They're cheap, they're scalable, they're effective, and people with severe mental illness have the same access and use of digital technology. So I know what you're thinking, it's another app, apps don't work, but they do work when they're combined with human support. So my project aim is to try and combine the two, a digital app with human support to lead to effective weight loss. How will I do that? Here's my project plan. It's a three-year plan. Do you mind if I don't talk through the plan? No. <laughs> um, I'll let you quickly talk through it. While you're reading through it, the bit I don't like about this one, which I'm going to come back to, the PPI is too casual, too perfunctory, too add-on. So they're trying to get away with the idea, PPI will be important throughout, OK. That, that's not going to cut it anymore, so that's the only bit I don't like. Back onto the bit I do like, I want to disseminate this as widely as possible. So I plan to talk at uh, you know, national and international conferences, multiple high-impact journals. I've already got links with mental health charities like Mind and Rethink. I use social media because it's extensive in its reach. Easy read summaries for people with severe mental illness. And also with all my first paper publications, I always produce a video. These are some examples. Two I'll highlight, one that was on The Lancet TV and one that I wrote, produced and also cast Ruby Wax in the role as the, the narrator. So these are good examples, but this is a person who's not really trying to drive home why you, should, why you should fund it. The bits I said I didn't like are PPI, so I'm going to jump back to the one from the midwife for a moment. This is much better. So she focused much more on PPI, and lots of funders take it really, really seriously. I think you've had stuff on this earlier. So she talked about the research collective that she's uh, working on, explained how it's going to do these four things. And then the bit I particularly like is when we see a project plan, it's actually a bit more integrated. You know, what's going to happen in terms of PPI through the four phases of her research? That is much more, I think, the kind of thing you should be doing. You might know, oh, maybe you will love this. I love this. You might not like this bit, but you do need to sell your project. Actually, clinicians are better at doing this, I think, than, than pure researchers. But I always read people's applications, and I always go through them with a highlighter pen, and I always think the bits that I highlight, I expect to hear in their pitch, and then invariably, it's, it's not like bingo at all. You never, you never hear any of them. So this was two professors at King's again, and I thought, how can you miss out all this great stuff? So I remember when I read it, I heard these things. You know, so young people are experiencing anxiety at alarming rates. Responses to treatment are highly variable. Genetic influence has barely been explored. Clinical trials are just way too expensive. And this, will, this is the potential work well beyond anxiety. They're the kind of things you have to get across in a pitch. Sometimes when you're so engrossed in your application, it is hard to see what sounds impressive. The other thing, uh, I did used to work for ITV. It's actually a very formal organization. It's tremendously formal, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, but they had this thing called the UST test. All, the, all media organisations know it. It's the superlative test. If you've got superlatives, you need to get them in your pitch. It doesn't mean trivial, silly ones. So there's these three for you. This will be the largest genome-wide association study of anxiety. Anxiety is the most commonly comorbid psychiatric disorder. This is the first genome-wide association study of psychological treatment response. You can't miss out little nuggets. People are too descriptive in their pitch. Do you know you've done a really detailed application? In the pitch, you've got to really make every single sentence count. So the first P is really, really important. I think those are the five questions you can work on. You can play around with it, and the, the funder might give you some guidance as to what they want, but pretty much that needs to be the basis of your project part. I will take questions at the end, but if there was something that doesn't make sense, will you just shout, shout as we go along? 
Is that okay so far? Okay. If you don't like selling your project, you really won't like the next bit either. But it, the next bit is you do have to sell yourself. And I watched, I watched 50 um, one-to-ones at UCL with the Wellcome Trust last year. So I, 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 there's a scheme between UCL and Wellcome for therapeutic innovation research. Small grants, but I train every single person and then I watch them all. And it is interesting how some people are in there really promoting themselves and some people are, are like wallflowers. So you do have to, to some degree, be quite direct and quite clear. This is a tricky one if you're an early career researcher because you've got to try and balance two things. Why should you fund me? But equally, if you do fund me, this is how I can develop and grow as a researcher. So we, do, we need to try and balance both of those things. Now is not the time to do a general CV about yourself. You have to be a little bit shameless and pick the things that are stand out about you. So this is the um, person looking at obesity and serious mental illness. We've got four boxes. The top two are descriptive. This is who I am. This is my clinical training. These are two aspects of me that I think stand out. One is the publication record, especially because it's got the Lancet Psychiatry. And on the other side, uh, it was a pitch to the NIHR and they'd won first prize in the media competition. And they were also trainee of the year with the Royal College of Psychiatrists. So you've got to pick stuff that makes you edge out other people. As you develop, this is someone from the LSE who I helped in October, it's a professorship. You've got to kind of up the ante a little bit. So they expect to see more. So now it's a bit more scholarly. You know, that's an amazing jump in six months from 46 to 52 on the H index. But it shows really, you know, strong publication record. Uh, as part of this pitch, they were gonna spend three months with each of those partners, you know, World Health Organization, World Economic Forum, UNICEF, that's quite an impressive array of organizations to be working with. Um, experience of leading multidisciplinary projects and capacity building, especially in low to middle income countries. And finally, in the place ranked number one for social sciences. She's very shy, I think she's fantastic. But she would, you know, she's very shy about her achievements, but you kind of have to force people sometimes to put stuff up there. Back to our midwife, the only reason I'm showing you this one is I like it more in that she's classified these four elements. Two of them we had a war over. Um, see, to me, it says here, support and mentorship, including from the Royal College of Midwives. It masks the fact she's actually got as a mentor the president of the Royal College of Midwives. And I think, well, say that. Honestly, say it. Don't hide it. She'll say, oh, it's in my application, but no one's read it. So, you know, seriously, no one. So you do have to work hard to bring that out. And this is the one we had the battle over. You can see the one there. She was uh, three years head of internal audit for a FTSE 500 company. And I said, you have to put that one in. And she was saying, why? What's that got to do with midwifery and women who have experienced trauma? Well, you know, research is not just about sitting behind a desk, being an academic. It's about managing a budget, project management, driving a project, persuading people, overcoming hurdles. If you've been good enough to be three years head of internal audit at a company of that size, I would feel we can trust you to manage some money here. So a pitch is quite commercial. You know, it's like Dragon's Den. Do we believe you can do it? Academically we might, but can you pull it off? Funders really hate funding things that just fizzle out, that never quite make it. And if they sense that early on, you know, they'll, they'll pull the rug on you. Just one more example. Uh, just, it's just clever the way this person has done this. She, I think, was the hardest working person I've ever worked with on a pitch. Um, she's a GP. She's kind of broken down her career on the right-hand side. And so she's sort of showing her publication record at each stage, uh, plus more. So in her posting there, she had uh, an article in the British Medical Journal, and it was about this questionnaire she produced that has actually been translated into eight languages and is now used in 20 countries, including the UK, the States, Australia, most of Western Europe. In her next post, see again, she's too shy. She had a top 10 paper in the British Journal of General Practice, but it was number two in terms of impact. So we should say top two. And in the final one, it's a shift, but she set up something called PACT, the Primary Care Academic Collaborative. She, she set it up, she chairs it, and has got these four high profile organizations all to either fund or sponsor it. I mean, that, that does speak volume about her ability to get stuff done. So sometimes it's, it, I have picked the best ones I can find. Don't worry if you think, gosh, I can't, I haven't done all these. You've got to try and find something, something that helps you stand out. 
then there's the bit where you've got to say, but listen, you know, also I've got a lot to learn. I need your help. Uh, this is how not to do it. So the one about severe mental illness, obesity, it was just an amazing pitch. This is the only horror slide. Uh, to me, when I looked at it, I thought I would reject you on that alone. <laughs> I'm being serious because when I was, do you know if I was interviewing people in the past and you said, come on, tell me about your development and they say, oh, I'll do a bit of teaching, a bit of mentoring, a couple of presentations. Well, you do that every day anyway. I mean, this is, this is where someone is lazy and thinks, I just, I said, where did you get that from? And she said, I just copied it off someone else. Which, that's, but that's true, you know, she's funny. That's what she's like. Uh, but it's just, it's, again, it's like, it used to be like PPI, I'll just put, stick something in about that. That's, that won't cut the mustard anymore. So two things. One is try and put your development plan in a trajectory. Uh, this guy's a basic scientist, not a clinician. But I like, you know, we did this together. He's very determined, you know, he wants to have his own research group. And he's saying, this is what I feel I've got already. He did say detail about these things. So he's got his PhD and he won an award for it. He's had good publications, actually. Uh, he's had funding along the way. He's a, a, an associate of the Higher Education Academy. And also, um, he's been elected leader of this mammalian behavioral group across all of Europe. That's where he is now. If you fund me, he is saying, I will advance towards my goal. So I'll enhance my research skills. I'll have access to mentoring, improve my collaborations and vision. And just there is detail behind these. So he's saying, these are the things I've got. If you fund me, I can complement them with this. So it's specific. It's not just, yeah, I'll improve. You know, they like it if they feel you thought through that this is actually going to happen, this development plan. I really like this. So if, if, if all else fails, go to this. It's free, so I like it even more. Um, buy an organization called Vitae, research a development framework. It's really well thought through. You might know it already. Apologies if you do. Uh, it has four domains, OK? It's, it's a way of working out where are the gaps in your development. These are the four domains. We'll just focus on this domain for a minute. Then there are subdomains. And then they're broken down into competencies. And here's some examples of how people have done it. So this was the GP. You know, she's saying, in terms of knowledge and intellectual abilities, I'm going to do that. These two are grouped together. I'm going to do that. And in terms of engagement and so on, I'm going to do that. Back to our obesity person. I remember her saying, this busy, this slide looks busy because I plan to be busy. It's the one slide that can look horrific. Because I think it should. You know, it's now. She was the one that had a couple of presentations, a bit of mentoring, blah, blah, blah. Now it's really detailed, comprehensive, <coughs> thorough. It looks like it's going to happen. Finally, finally, uh, third P, place. There's three things that I focus on, really. You can't just say, guess what, I'm at Oxford or I'm at Cambridge. We're, you know, we're the best. It's just much more specific than that, or no one else would ever get any funding. So it might be you pick, for example, here, your supervisors. If um, I'm allowed to say it, the, the GP, who I thought was sensational, got turned down on the first application because they didn't like the quality of her supervisors. It's like just a tiny little fly in the ointment. They just thought they were, but she applied again and got it. No one is going to say that here. Uh, two supervisors. One is Professor Anne Blanford. She set up and manages the world-leading Institute of Digital Health. She's also got Professor Elizabeth Murray, ditto in terms of world-leading e-health unit. And as a mentor, she's got Professor Sonia Johnson, who's the head of the mental health policy research unit. That's kind of a strong backup to have. You can't hide that. Our friend who, who, who did the roadmap, he's from Liverpool. Not just saying, yeah, Liverpool's a great institute. It needs to be specific. So two things. Um, he said Liverpool hosts the largest behavioural and evolution centre in the world. He's got access to it, complete access guaranteed for all of his work, specialising in wild mice and wild rats. He also has negotiated a deal with Liverpool's Centre for Genomic Research. They're going to do all of his data processing for free and they're going to train him up in a range of techniques. Funders don't like it if they're putting everything in. They, they like you to say, listen, you're going to fund this, but the university is going to give me that. LSE are the world's worst at it. The one the LSE will just virtually do nothing because they think we don't have to offer anything because we're so elite. So the person I spoke to you a minute ago, the, the university just wouldn't do anything. It's really tough. Uh, most universities will work a lot harder, especially if you try and negotiate that. But again, this guy is a sensation. Academically, this guy is a sensation from Edinburgh. 
you must use peer reviews. I heard them being spoken of earlier. Sometimes it's so funny, the peer reviews almost write the pitch for you. So this one person said, you know, the research environment at the MRC genetics unit is excellent. This is an amazing assembly of individuals in one geographic location that will really cement the success of this project. I'd be cheering if someone said that about me. And then they said even better, look, you know, all the resources and experts are here, multiple world leaders in chromosome biology, um, blah, blah, blah. It's, uh, look, the aim is like, they're just saying it all for you, the aim is likely to succeed since all the required techniques, equipment, expertise are present either in the lab or through collaborations. Exciting data already exists, makes it even more likely that important discoveries will be made. You have to say stuff like that if you can justify it. He didn't say any of it. You know, he was, because people are so descriptive. Finally, 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 you need to do a great pitch, you need to have the three Ps, but then you want to end on a high note. Most people end on a low note, and what they give is standard information. And they will say, yes, yeah, so um, pretty much that's what I wanted to say, and uh, thanks for your time. <laughs> or, you know, and I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, any questions. It's all a downer. In a pitch, you can't afford to do that. So what you should do is return to where you started. You should do this in every talk, to be honest. You should do all the pleasantries, but then you should wrap up properly. So just to give you an example, when this one ended, we planned it so that she would say, so thank you once again for letting me pitch today. You know, I hope I've made it clear and I'm happy to answer all of your questions. But I wanted to show you that prostate cancer is a killer. It affects one in eight men, but three in eight if you're black. But we found a simple, cost-effective, workable solution to it. If you're prepared to roll that out London-wide, it will have a tremendous impact on public health and a tremendous impact on the number of people dying from prostate cancer. If you think it sounds too salesy, it's four and a half thousand years old, this technique. It's called epinolepsis. The Greeks discovered everything there is to know about presenting. It's simply, imagine bookends or a mirror. What you start with is what you end with. So epinolepsis is the repeated use of the same word pattern uh, as a rhetorical device. It, all, all great speeches do it. All great presentations do it. You should do it all the time. Whatever you start with, we go off on this journey and we end with it, either visually but definitely verbally. So it seems neat and compact. Is that all right so far? Can I... I'll be two minutes with this final bit. Um, I watched all these uh, things the other day at um, UCL. The pictures were all good. They were all really quite good. And then about 40% <laughs> of the Q&As were literally a car crash. I mean, really, really, really bad. Uh, and I realised, uh, in industry, it's the same. People aren't good at handling a Q&A under pressure. It is really tough, but academics, if I'm honest, can be really, find it really difficult. So a few things. I know I'm being really dictatorial. You have to do this, OK? You have to anticipate and try and hit 90% of the questions that come up. You really should hit 90%. There is no excuse not to. There's always going to be the odd curveball, but you should be ready for most of them. And the way to do that is you might want to look at the peer reviews. They will definitely tell you things that they don't like or things they're questioning. I'm sure your institute will do lots of mock interviews with you. So make a note of all of them. And also, do you remember that little Moscow acronym? You can only include the musts, but now is your chance, if you're clever, that you get more of your stuff in. So you kind of think, I also want to say this and I want to say that. So what I get people to do is two lists. Here's all the questions that might come up. And then over here, 10 things I want to say to also back my case up. And then you just cross-reference them and think, if they ask me about methodology, I'm going to get that one and that one in. So don't just be purely reactive. Try and get more of your stuff across. You need to plan your answers. Do you know, it's very difficult under pressure just to think of them. And when you plan your answers, will you use this format? Uh, I used to train all of the journalists at ITV and all of the board who were public-facing to handle the media. And we just used to drill everyone to do a four-stage uh, summary. I think you, someone said to you, can I apply for this grant if there's this? And you said yes. <laughs> uh, that's what we want. The first thing is answer the question as quickly as you can. Do you know, people have got this <laughs> habit of meandering. So a classic example would be, do you know, they say this is a very ambitious project. Are you sure you can pull this off to time and to budget? You need to answer them immediately. I know we don't want to be too bullish, but you can say, yes, I am, I am very confident that we can do this on time. Elaborate. The reason I say that is lots of the data I'm going to use already exists, and I have access to it. In my team, we've got experience using these techniques, and I'll be trained on them. And thirdly, something else. So yes, it's a complex project. It's ambitious, but I'm very confident I can do it. 
one of these pitches, they said, uh, this project's going to be in Brazil, COVID's a nightmare, what contingency have you got in place? And they said, well, I have a contingency. If we can't do it in Brazil, we do it in South Africa. But actually, I'm very confident I can do it in Brazil. 40% of the population are already vaccinated, mostly in the two major cities. That's where my project's going to be. I've taught myself Portuguese over the last four years, so I feel I can work. She has. She has. <laughs> so I feel I can communicate. I've got a group of network, a network of researchers that I'm already used to working with, and I'm doing that in capacity building. And also during COVID, I launched a similar app that was logistically more difficult. So yes, it's going to be awkward. I've got a backup if necessary. I don't think I'm going to need it. You have to kind of punch them on the nose in the panel. You do, or they'll just find all kinds of faults. This is what happens if you don't anticipate questions. This is Stefan, the guy from Liverpool. Brilliant at answering questions when he knew it was going to say horrendous. If, But that's interesting. You know, only one came up that we were, hadn't predicted. And then, of course, totally cocked it up. A few more things. This is so basic, I'm embarrassed to tell you. Um, but loads and loads of people interrupt. They do. They just interrupt the panel because they're on a high. You just need to pause, think about what you're going to say, and then start. Uh, the panel might be quite into it, and they might say, well, hang on a minute, are you sure this is the right methodology? And what experience do you have of that, and why haven't you done this instead? You know, they're allowed. They're allowed to do it. You need to note multiple questions and answer them in that order. Sometimes, because they've not read your application, they say stuff that's wrong, and then the whole room's influenced by it. So if somebody says something that you think, actually, they've misunderstood me, or I've not explained myself, you need to be really, really clear at putting a plug in that. And at the same time, I would find it increasingly difficult to do this. Don't get agitated by it. You need to be friendly, enthusiastic, but you need a poker face on when people are really trying to pull you apart. <coughs> Three final things. Uh, I need to do this. Keep it short. You might have five to ten minutes for a pitch, 20 minutes for questions. You can't spend four minutes answering one question. It needs to be kind of bang, bang, bang. You need to you know, quicker. Quicker, not whole presentations all over again. If you don't know the answer... It's absolutely fine. That's science. That's normal. But try not to say too many times, well, I don't know. You know, I don't know that one either, actually. Uh, you might, you just, what you might want to do is try to compensate. You're not going to like this example, I know, but it's just when Boris Johnson was asked, you know, when am I going to get my vaccine? He could say, oh, who knows? You know, your guess is as good as mine. But what he'd probably say is, listen, I can't tell you precisely, but what I can tell you, we're going to do people in five-year age ranges, include people with severe health needs, so that by... Midsummer, everyone over 50 will be done. I, it's not what you want, but I can give you something. Conversation is really, really important to show you forward it through. And finally, if you're clever and the chair indicates to you that this is the last question, which they, really, they might well do, don't end on the answer to that question. Try and repeat your summary again. So on that London bus one, this is the last thing I'm going to say, um, it's really weird. The last question was, how much does it cost to put a London, uh, sorry, an advert on the back of a London bus? You, I would think to myself, what a waste of time asking that question when I've got my key points to make. But you have to answer it. So you might say, it costs £600 to put the, an advert on the back of a London bus. We had a very small marketing budget, so we thought it was the most effective way to do that. And that typifies everything we've done in this project. We want maximum numbers of men to come in for minimum cost. So I hope you see this project's cheap, effective, scalable, and we can roll it London-wide. It's going to have a tremendous practical impact on diagnosing prostate cancer. So all you've got to get used to is answer something and being able to bridge to your summary. It's actually it's really easy. It's really easy if you practice it. So I know that was a whistle-stop tour, but I wanted to give you loads of examples because I know you might have to pitch quite soon. The people in the room, you're going to pitch on Thursday. Um, but it can be enjoyable. You know, it can be good fun. It can be enjoyable if you practice and if you're confident with what you're going to say. So thank you for listening. And uh, let me know if there's any questions. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Simon. So we'll go to the uh, virtual delegates. Um, okay. Karen. Um, great, thank you. So Simon said approximately 70% of the pitch should be spent on the project section. Should the remaining 30% be split equally between the person and place, or would you give one more time over the other? I would just give more time to the one that I thought I could sell better, if I'm honest, okay. for sure. But both need to be included in that, yeah, in that 30%. Okay, lovely. Um, saying, what a great session, love the presentation. Hope they want to watch it again already. <laughs> I, I type that one in for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay.
Okay. Um, in the room. Bring any questions from the, the room? No, just <laughs> oh, good. No, thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So sorry. Yeah. So if there isn't much like big examples you have shown, they have got like ten million grants, oh, Lancet right. publications. Yeah yeah. 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 And yeah. So what to do in that? No, so. but you know, it's the panel will only. You know, if you're if you're doing a PhD and it's your first application, they won't expect all that. And you know, thing other skills are really important. I just think be creative, and uh, you've got to just try and find things that show you're an all rounder. You know, academically, have you got it? Clinically, have you got it? Have you got, um, you know, experiences related? Well, you can find something. Yeah, like the captain of the cricket team in the past. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's Absolutely. right. And head of the library, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And no then, sandpaper jokes. But, just seriously, but you might then focus a little bit on who you've got around you, the quality of your supervisors, the quality of your team, and so on. Can I just make one point which Simon said, which is that many of the panel won't read your application? So the first MRC panel I did, I was going to print off the papers. There's two and a half thousand bits of paper I was going to have to read. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that there's 15 people on your panel, but two people usually for most panels will be the lead people who have read every single page. The others will have skim read, if, you, if you're lucky, the application mm -hmm. or read the abstract. So the pitch that you're doing really does have to be simple because you're not really pitching to the two people who have read it, you're pitching to the other panel members and everybody has an equal score. Yeah. So everything Simon said is, you know, is round to you. Yeah, no, thanks for, thanks for that. It's great. And can I just say, you're joking about the captain of the cricket team. Um, some of those things that you're doing outside academia are actually really important. And one of the really useful bits of advice that um, I was given early on is to get someone else to do your project, your person um, spec, so that you know you're you're not kind of reverting back to oh I don't have I don't I don't know I haven't done much. In fact, you know they they are often uh, better at selling that aspect. Any other questions? So Simon, thank you so much. No, thank We're, you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, I think I'm expecting to see a lot of things come up on Thursday morning. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see. And we'll let you know uh, <laughs> yes. which yeah, ones yeah, actually absolutely. were embedded. So oh, thank right. you so much. No, thanks for having me. Thanks very much.